médecin, qu'est-ce que c'est Le tisseur. Il a dit gosse. Et c'est vieux avec lui. On le paie un sol de l'heure. Alors il travaille aussi la nuit. Bon, sans doute pas dans les églises, hein. Qui sait même si le bon Dieu sans doute. Ça dort pas les pauvres la nuit. Ça travaille. Ça s'insulte. Ça se bat. <coughs> s'attendrir. Il faut faire comme les voisins, il faut s'en foutre. C'est bon pour les riches de s'attendrir. Les pauvres, ils en ont assez. Chacun pour soi. This is Criteria. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Criteria. I'm Thomas Miris. I'm here with my co-host, James Majewski. Hey there, everyone. Uh, so normally we do this in the same room. And I'm in my my Catholic Culture Podcast studio, otherwise known as my bedroom slash office uh, right now, instead of our living room, which is where we normally do criteria. The reason for that is because I am currently in quarantine. I'm not sick, uh, but my roommate has COVID. He's he's on his way to being better, thankfully. Um, but for a couple more days, at least, I'm going to have to be... Uh, staying in here. So that's why James couldn't be, unfortunately, with me physically today. Um, but uh, we are back to talk about another Saint film. We recently did Alain Cavalier's uh, wow, I did that pretty good. We really struggled with that pronunciation <laughs> last, last time. Uh, his his really wonderful, unique film, Therese, we talked about that with our Canadian filmmaker friend, Nathan Douglas. And uh, now we are back to another a uh, film from the religion section of the Vatican film list, uh, a film that won the, I believe, 1948 Oscar for best foreign film, uh, a film about St. Vincent de Paul, Monsieur Vincent, something like that. And uh, maybe a little bit too much there, but uh, we'll just we'll just go with that. Um, so we have with us, we don't often have film critics as guests. We often will have like a poet or a painter or just some random person who uh, isn't necessarily an expert on film, but is passionate about a particular film that we're discussing. Um, today is different. We have with us, I'm going to say the biggest name in Catholic film <laughs> uh, reviewing today, uh, Deacon Stephen Gradanis. He is the film critic for the National Catholic Register. You can find his collected work at his website, decentfilms.com. Uh, he is, as I indicated, a permanent deacon of the Archdiocese of Newark. And also, I'll note that the first time another writer quoted my work, uh, my own writing at catholicculture.org was way back in 14, uh, 2014, when Stephen quoted my review of the Darren Aronofsky film, Noah, which was quite exciting for a beginning writer. Nobody else has quoted me since, to my knowledge, <laughs> <laughs> by the way, but it was pretty cool at the time. Uh, so, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure and, and especially a pleasure to talk about this film. Um, there's a little bit of a first for me as a writer in this film. Uh, my review of Monsieur Vincent was blurbed on the back of the, DV, uh, the DVD box. Um, wow. And, and as far as I know, that's the first and only time that that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. I have that DVD box. Okay. Well, I, I don't have it on me right now, but I'm going to dig it up after this episode and, and marvel. <laughs> Well, I don't know. You know, I don't know how many Saint films I've seen. I've typically avoided them, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, with good reason. Um, Most of them are, are not great. Not great cinema. 
we loved Therese. There's some weird things about it, but it's it's pretty incredible, and it's clearly like a a it's truly a work of cinema. It's it's a really unique work, um, and very beautiful in its portrayal of saintly joy. This film, though, I have to say, this might be the best saint film that I've seen so far. Um, and and I will say uh, also one thing that comes up on this podcast is the question of like. So, so there's this kind of truism of the best religious films are made by, you know, non-religious people or something like that. And I understand where that's coming from, but with some of them, I do question whether these films are fundamentally religious or whether they're just great films that have kind of, you know, incidentally religious subject matter. With uh, Cavalier's Therese, uh, this is this is a, a film, and I think that this is true of a lot of the religious movies um, that come from filmmakers or writers who are agnostic or who are atheist, um, mm-hmm. that that the film doesn't have necessarily a religious motivation, but there is something about the um, the role of religion in the characters of the film that draws filmmakers to them. I think that's mm. clearly the case um, with Robert Bolt and yes. uh, his yes. his two. Uh, significant religious works, A Man for All Seasons and The Mission. Uh, Bolt was was not a believer, but there was something about Thomas More's sanctity and the the moral commitment that came from his religious beliefs that attracted him. This is the same thing with uh, Mark Twain and and his novel on Joan mm. of Arc, which was he he considered his favorite of all of his novels. Yeah, I was about to bring up A Man for All Seasons because we discussed the same issue when we discussed our film early on and uh, discussed that film early on in this podcast. Um, so I'm going to say this film is, I think, clearly a religious film. I have no knowledge whatsoever about the uh, the religious beliefs of any of the people involved. I do know that the director, um, Maurice Cloche, apparently became known for making a few films uh, about great figures of Christian charity. I don't know if they were all based on true stories like this one or not. Uh, Stephen, are you familiar with any of his other works? I know that he did make a number of other religious films. The only one that I'm really familiar with is The Small Miracle, also called Never Take No for an Answer, which is a very sweet, pious story about a young Italian boy seeking a miracle of healing from the Pope for his sick donkey. Um, hmm. So, uh, and, and I, I know that um, one of, of the writers, um, Jean Anu, um, he, he also wrote the, the stage play uh, Beckett, on, on which the 1964 film um, starring Richard Burton mm. and Peter O'Toole was based. Uh, I think he did significantly more research for Monsieur Vincent <laughs> because he later discovered to his chagrin after writing Beckett that the um, the biography that he had based it on was uh, factually wrong about a number of important points, including the fact that, that Thomas Beckett was actually a Norman and, and not a Saxon. That's a rather important point in the film that's wrong. Um, Monsieur mm. Vincent, I... I as far as I can tell, is significantly better research. That's not to say that it gets everything about its subject right from a historical perspective, um, but there's a lot of good history and good spirituality uh, connected to uh, to Vincent de Paul in the film. Right. Yeah, you mentioned the screenwriter here. There were there were two. One of them was a film guy. One of them was a theater guy. Uh, the the film guy being Jean Bernard Luc, who I don't think is really well known at all. But uh, Jean and we is quite well known. You mentioned Beckett. He's probably best known for his adaptation of Sophocles' Antigone. Um, And then uh, I just want to point out before we get into the meat of this film, a couple of the other people who made it, because there's some interesting connections here to films that we've already discussed. uh, Disgusted? No. (laughs) There's sorry. Uh, There's an interesting connection uh, to some of the films we've already discussed. So the cinematography for this film is by Claude Renoir the nephew of director Jean Renoir, who directed uh, Grand Illusion, one of our favorite films that we've seen on this list so far. Uh, and and Claude was an assistant cameraman on that film. Um, there's another connection to this, which I really, I watched this entire film without realizing it, but the lead actor, Pierre Frenet, 
uh, played the awesome Bourdieu in Grand Illusion. Bourdieu, um, that's right. Bourdieu. One of one of the two French officers who gets shot down by Eric von Stroheim's um, uh, yeah. Caf- Captain uh, Ralfenstein. Um, that's right, and he's so awesome. He's such a cool character. Yeah. Um, one thing I've noticed about well, let me. I'll, get to that in a second but uh i i read that this role as saint vincent rehabilitated him after he started a bunch of films made by a nazi run film company oh. during the occupation of france he was even put in jail for like a month or something because of it and then the, i think the charges were either dropped or he was declared innocent for uh, uh, collaboration um but one thing i was going to say is that i've noticed with a bunch of these pre new wave french films that they're very accessible to uh, an American sensibility, at least of of that time, I think. Like, Grand Illusion is totally entertaining. There's all this awesome dialogue that is very appealing to an American. And this film is not the same sort of film, but it's still this very, like, classical style. The narrative is straightforward. It's not this, like, overtly uh, kind of, like, I don't know, uh, Godard or uh, the 400 Blows or something, this sort of overtly um, experimental work or anything like that. It's it's just like a really top of the top notch uh, narrative filmmaking, and uh, I think that we've watched a number of challenging films on this on this list. Um, but people should know that this is actually quite accessible. You could totally watch it with with your family. Well, and and it's really a, a masterclass in cinematic storytelling on a number of levels. Uh, one of the things that's really striking to me about the film from a cinematic perspective is how little dialogue there is in the opening act um, mm. when uh, when Saint Vincent goes to uh, Châtillon Le um where he this is uh, the, the film doesn't get into this history, but we see a little bit later that he has been a chaplain to a very uh, wealthy and prestigious family, and he seems to have wanted to got to get away from that, uh, to to be closer to people who are who are poor and needy, um, and this is really kind of the tension in the film. Um, the, the, he's the, we see Vincent. Vincent is is seen in the film as a man who is constantly being torn between the attention and admiration of the wealthy and the prestigious and the illustrious, who the film often depicts as being uh, rather frivolous and self-absorbed and vain and, and so forth. And then what he feels is his real calling to the poor, who are not necessarily any morally better than the rich. He, he mm-hmm. describes them as um, uh, being... Uh, ugly and demanding and and vulgar um, and and touchy, um, but but they have a moral claim on him. So he arrives at this village, at this town, um, Châtillon, uh, which is in the grip of of the Black Plague, and uh, he wanders through the streets, and the streets are deserted, and the only sound we hear is this unnerving clatter of stones mm. that people are throwing from the window in order to try to drive him away because they don't want anyone spreading the disease. And mm. um, and so, so much of the opening act proceeds in silence. And it's, it's really a wonderful example of cinema as, as a visual art. Fundamentally, cinema is first and foremost a visual art and then secondly an aural art and then you can bring in dialogue and music uh and 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 so forth this isn't a film uh i i think with any i don't think there's any non-diegetic sound i don't think there's a soundtrack at all we do hear music but i think it's always in frame always in the story Mm. um but but the visuals are first and foremost and uh, Renoir's cinematography is really very, very classical, uh, moving very fluidly between objective and subjective points of view. Um, uh, it, 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 it all it, it draws you into the story and into the drama and into what this what this priest is doing in his village that clearly doesn't want him. Yeah, Stephen, I'm glad you brought all of that up because I thought that that was very striking too. How the film accomplishes all so much in such a short span of time, not just in terms of exposition and introducing us to this character, but also uh, drawing us in as viewers. Um, there's so many exciting moments with the camera. I'm thinking, 
for instance, uh, when he first arrives at the church, that's kind of decrepit and fallen apart. And it's like you said, we're, we're switching between objective and subjective points of view as we move through this dilapidated chapel and Monsieur Vincent is mounting the altar. It's kind of like this liturgical procession up onto the altar and then he's throwing things down. Um, you mentioned that uh, there's not, there's, there's a lot of use of silence and visual communication, but this is just as true of the cinematography of the film as it is of, uh, the performance here, Pierre Fresnay, that's his, uh, his name, the actor, yeah. um, yes. he, he has an amazing capacity for stillness and expression through the eyes, which I think is such a, uh, a hallmark of excellent on-screen performance. Uh, and, 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 but it's also something that lives in his body as well. We see that when he's clearing the altar, it, 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 it evokes the, uh, you know, Jesus, uh, driving the, the money changers out with the, the cord, but also in, in, moments of uh, quieter moments, uh, for instance, when he's alone in his room with the, uh, the, the woman who's been sent up, you know, ostensibly to, to, to seduce him. There's like a whole scene that plays out between the two of them in silence with glances, with expressions and, and in the eyes. It's yeah. really quite remarkable. Yeah, I uh, that that opening scene struck me too, Stephen. At the top of your review of this film, uh, which I read after my first viewing, uh, you described him as uh, single-minded, and that was exactly the word that came to mind myself uh, when watching the film. And we really get a sense of that in the opening scenes, just in the way that he responds to the rocks being thrown at him, uh, that he's not freaking out. You know, um, when he goes into this church you immediately get like a, a wide shot of the, the, you know, the decay of this building, the, the, the lapsed state of things. And uh, he's walking by and I think there's a chicken uh, and he kind yeah. of like, yeah, uh, there's a, there's a chicken in the, in a holy water stoop. Yeah. Or bap- it's in it's a, a baptismal ooh. font. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And he doesn't get mad at the chicken. He doesn't push it off. He kind of like, he he picks Pets. it up and he puts it on the ground. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. then when he gets to the altar and there's some kind of casks, I don't know if they're supposed to be casks of wine or what, uh, he like really, that's the first time you see him get emotional. Mm. And like, I mean, obviously there's plenty of emotions, but I mean like sort of uh, exercised. Um, and he sweeps them off, you know, kind of with this violent force. Uh, and so we get all these different modes of expression from him just when he's going through the streets and going into this church, which is, it's which the is same, really telling. It's the same when he goes into the supposed plague victim's home and mm-hmm. he's tearing the boards off and breaking down the door. And then the tenderness later when he picks up her daughter and, and leaves, right? Um, it, that too, that sequence, the visual storytelling is really precise because we don't even see the the daughter initially he enters in and he has this moment with the now dead plague victim who turns out not to have been a plague victim after all um before we see in the corner of the frame her daughter coming out of the shadows it's almost i think if i'm recalling correctly we see his response before yes. we actually see her okay. in the frame so it, it is this really kind of excellent very specific visual storytelling that's going yeah. on, but that's it's a, that's a really good observation. And um, it also, I think, another thing that's very important to the film that we see established here in the opening is is a really delicate balancing of contradictory tones. Mm. Um, there is the the wrenching um, sense of of pathos around this poor woman who's been boarded into her home, and and the outrage. Um, of people doing such a thing. And I have to say, um, revisiting this film, I, I, I watched it again in preparation for this podcast this past week. And I have to say, um, watching the, the Plague Town scenes in the post-COVID era is very different from yes. having watching, watched it ever before. Yes. Um, but, but then there's also almost this sense of 
satire and and ridicule around the um the wealthy people who are boarded up in their own homes you know not not boarded in but but boarding the world out and and engaged in their their frivolous play and uh completely unconcerned with the suffering that's going on outside of their door um, yeah you know the film is honest about the uh the as you said the vices of the poor but it mocks the rich in a way that it does not mock the poor. I would say in their in their vices. Yeah, that's that's a fair observation, and and that that satire grows even sharper later on as as Vincent is organizing uh, the Ladies of Charity, um, and <laughs> we see yeah, right. <laughs> uh, the, the, these these uh, uh, wealthy Paris ladies who uh, are are like filmmakers who are not people of faith drawn to the sanctity of Vincent de Paul. They, they see in him something that draws them like moths to a flame, and yet <laughs> they're not necessarily where he is or anywhere very close to that, and, and they don't necessarily recognize how their, um, um, their ideas about status and mm. social standing um, and, and the idea of who's in and who's out is an obstacle to the work that Vincent wants to do and that on some level they want to be partners in but which their own short-sightedness and their own vices and, and really at times very, very silly uh, attitudes prevent mm. them from proceeding very far. I think one of the ways that this film excels is in its depiction of the rich and the poor, uh, which you've already mentioned, Stephen, uh, both both not really being sugarcoated, right? Um, but at the same time, not uh, irredeemable. We're, we're given instances both of rich and poor who, though flawed, are still sincere or driven by by goodness i'm thinking uh for an example of the the rich person is the duchess of gondi she um she's not nearly as ridiculous as some of the other char rich characters that we're introduced to but we do see some of the um the i don't know how to characterize it the kind of uh, uh neediness in her her attachment to monsieur vincent um maybe some of her melodrama in trying to keep him with her uh but but we also see a real sincere desire for for spiritual growth for service um and and the film does a really great job of sort of towing this line so we'll get one scene of her, you know, dismissing her servants and taking off her fine gloves and hanging laundry, immediately followed by the scene that you mentioned with this council of rich ladies who are just gossiping and uh, uh, totally missing the point. The same with with the, the depiction of the poor here. It's not cookies and gumdrops. It's not an idealized vision of the poor, but very much one that in that looks at the whole picture of brokenness and bitterness and there's a line in there uh spoken by a a a pauper a young pauper man who comes and sleeps on St. Vincent's um uh floor where he says uh, the rich can afford to care the poor have had enough and so this 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 ugliness to poverty that's not just a spirit, not just a, a economic or a physical impoverishment, but even a moral impoverishment or, or, or spiritual malnourishment. Um, and it embraces that while at the same time indicating that there's redemption here too. There's a line later where, where St. Vincent realizes the poor will rescue the poor, uh, or something to that effect. So yeah. it, it's this film, this, uh, there are contradictory tones and contra and contradictory depictions. It's a it's a moral complexity that uh, that is is a, a balance that struck very carefully throughout. And there's um, a connection between, as you pointed out, the the moral poverty and the the physical poverty. Vincent says at one point that he has had a kind of a revelation. He realizes that um, that the poor must be given 
uh, space in order to have awareness and in order mm. to have a conscience. It's, it's that just to have the leisure to think about things from a truly human perspective, you need to have a certain distance from sheer desperation. From, mm. from the most fundamental realities of, of survival. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult to, to rise above that when, um, uh, when your desperation is, is that real. And one of the things that makes Fresne's performance so, uh, modulated and, and keeps him from being what is sometimes called a, a Mary Sue or, or a voice of perfection, um, right. is, is is the fact that in a certain way the film depicts his journey as a constant experience of conversion mm. he is always coming to a deeper appreciation of the scope of the problem of the depths of of uh, of human suffering and and he was this is now let's let just just to get into his background and his history a little bit um this is a man who was raised uh in a peasant family uh, his family uh, they they got by but only through hard work and 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 skimping on everything and when he went into the priesthood initially um um Vincent de Paul's hope was to to rise in the ranks and to become successful you know in order to support his family he he had um, he had that goal of supporting his family, and over the first twenty years of his um, uh, of his priesthood, w which we see the the end of in this film. The film starts in uh, sixteen fourteen, and then we could really use some more time markers after that, because <laughs> between sixteen fourteen and uh, sixteen forty five, uh, we cover a lot of distance. And it, the the first big time jump is kind of disorienting. The movie doesn't doesn't really let you know, and it's one of the things. What the first time I watched the film, I, I kind of I had a, a, almost a sense of being overwhelmed because although. The storytelling is very classical. The chronology is not always as clear as it could be. Mm -hmm. um, but but over over the course of his ministry, he has this continually deepening experience. He has that sense in the scene that you mentioned, uh, where he is staying in a Paris flat. The first place that he looks at is too nice. Uh, he finds another place that's even cheaper. Um, but it's even a little bit more lowly than he expected, because as you say, the previous res the previous tenant in that room used to let this um, this young man with uh, tuberculosis sleep on his floor. He comes in, and as this young man opens to Vincent rather eloquently the depths of suffering around him, Vincent has this, forgive me, Lord, I, I didn't know experience. Yeah, we, we see it again in a very powerful way in the hospice that Vincent founds. Um, as he's trying to bring in and make room for a man who is a double amputee, he has no legs and uh, there are no beds. And he tries his, um, his moral exhortation technique. He says, who is willing to make room for a sicker man? And nobody responds. One man pulls the covers up more tightly around himself. He walks around the room and then comes a moment when you think the movie has given the final twist of the knife. And Vincent has in, not so much solved the problem, but, but he, has, he has seen the problem to its resolution. One of the people in one of the beds has died. And Vincent closes his eyes and he says, now there's a bed. But there isn't. There's a man on the floor who's been waiting for that man to die for three days. And then another man who says he's been waiting even longer. And soon the whole place is broken into a free for all. People are fighting over beds and Vincent is completely overwhelmed. Mm. And, and that sense that, that he is continually confronted by problems that are bigger than he is, is, um, is part of what makes his drama so affecting. In fact, this is even present at the end when he's sitting with the queen and saying, I had to wait, I had to get old before I could learn that uh, one could live on four hours of sleep, right? That there's still this sense that he's, he's converting and learning. And, uh, and as he approaches death, this final visitor that he mentions, there's, it's the continuation of this through line and, and the, the effort of, of having run the race. I think that that's kind of the definitive rebuke to, 
anyone who might want to characterize this as a saccharine treatment of uh, a, a super holy saint, as if there isn't a struggle or a, a drama, even a high drama that's present in this film. Right. But it does. this film doesn't fall into the trap of, well, this will be unrealistic unless we make this character... Uh, you know, conflicted about his basic mission right. in life. And right. so the 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 uh the dramas, the interior dramas we get with him are the dramas of a soul who is already advanced in spiritual life. And that's something that you see very rarely done uh in a film. Um and you you mentioned this young man, both of you mentioned this young man who stays with him. And that is really uh one of the big maybe the big turn in the film uh, in terms of an actual change in his attitude as opposed to a deepening um, where he, yeah, he realizes that he didn't know the, like the moral and psychological squalor of the poor in addition to their material uh, poverty. And yes, it's this beautiful scene where there's just lying and listening to the sounds in this, I guess it's an apartment building and, um, mm -hmm. And they're hearing the man beating his wife downstairs. They're hearing and then making up. They're hearing uh, the crazy woman who cackles every 15 minutes upstairs. You're hearing the weaver who makes a little money that he has to work at night as well to support his family. And uh, this, there's this wonderful monologue by this this young man. And uh, I think I think that this this process in Vincent has already started because he goes decides to stay in these poor lodgings and this woman who lives there sends her daughter to seduce him because they they think they'll get more help that way and it doesn't go very far it's very awkward but you see this kind of realization and shock on his face and then it kind of comes home when he's in his room and this young man is talking about explaining what's going on in the building and he has this whole thing, you know, the poor don't, people don't realize the poor don't sleep at night. You know, they, uh, they fight, they, they cough, they make more poor people. Uh, and it is this huge turn as, as you already, you know, explained, but the scene itself is so well done that I thought it was yeah. worth detailing a little bit more. The, the exploration of the struggles of a man who is advanced in holiness. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the rarity of seeing that in cinema. And I want to mention a quotation that I love uh, that really illuminates that in a powerful way. It's, it's a, um, uh, a provocative and, and not entirely accurate assessment, but there's, there is a lot of truth to it. Simone Weil said, um, imaginary evil is romantic and varied. Real evil is gloomy, monotonous, barren, boring. Imaginary good is boring. Real good is always new, marvelous, intoxicating. Imaginative literature, therefore, and I think we can expand that to include, you know, even often um, um, stories that are based on a true story. Uh, imaginative literature, therefore, is either boring or immoral, or a mixture of both. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite an indictment. And, and there I've are... never heard the end of that. But I've heard the first part, <laughs> but I never heard that conclusion before. <laughs> oh, the, yes, this is the conclusion. That's, that's the stinger. Imaginative right. literature, therefore, is boring or immoral or a mixture of both. And that there are certainly exceptions to that. And, and not few exceptions, but they are exceptions there is an insight there i think there's a, there's an insight there there's a truth there that covers certainly not all of imaginative literature but a significant amount of imaginative literature and even a significant amount of hagiography and and other kinds of of fact based storytelling which is why um films like this uh you know I, I, and when i think of of the great saint biopics or the great movies about saints um there are I guess five that are on the Vatican film list. Um, there's Monsieur Vincent. Uh, there's A Man for All Seasons, which we've already mentioned, um, and Therese, the the Cavalier film. Um, uh, there's uh, The Passion of Joan of Arc, which is just about the last six months in in the life of Joan of Arc, her trial. 
Um, there's Rossellini's The Flowers of St. Francis, which is more about St. Francis spirituality and in particular more about the kind of bumblings of his followers than it is really about Francis himself. And then after that, outside of that, we, we got, we got a real gift just a couple of years ago from Terrence Malick in a hidden life. Right. Yeah. Um, the, the film, um, about the, the first life. film James and I discussed in a, in oh, a podcast. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, there's, there's the song of Bernadette, of course. Um, I think uh, Edward uh, Dimitrik's The Reluctant Saint uh, about Joseph of Cupertino is often overlooked. I think I think it's a film that's better than its reputation. Um, and after that, the list gets thin. Um, mm-hmm. There's a very good film about St. Faustina Kowalska called Faustina, 1995, Polish film. Um, the movie about Romero starring Raul Julia is good. It's not a great film. It's certainly not, you know, it's, it's not great cinema the way that this movie is great cinema. Um, so, so it really is, it is a special and rare thing. Yeah. Well, you, I first discovered this movie maybe 10 years ago, uh, rather by chance. I think I picked up the DVD at a used DVD store and I, I, I was blown away. In fact, this was before I, uh, I, I, I was in seminary for a few years and this, Watching this film had a lot to do with with awakening uh, a desire for me of of pursuing the priesthood because of the of the model of priesthood and and of of priestly charity and heroism really that's uh, presented in this film. But I I thought then and I still think now why does it seem like this film isn't given more attention? Oftentimes, even outside of religious circles, there's discussion of films like. Diary of a Country Priest, or uh, Leon Morin Priest, or uh, more recently a film like Calvary, uh, but but Mr. Vincent does not. I, I I might be wrong, but it doesn't seem like uh, it's it's watched as widely or discussed as widely as some of those other films. Do do either of you have any idea why? You're you're not wrong, and I think the main reason is that um, uh, Maurice Cloche is is not hugely known for anything else. Um, mm. This is his best known film, and and um, all of the other films that you mention, the directors are discussed for other reasons, and that brings the religious films that they make to the forefront of the larger uh, cinematic discussion. Um, so you know, the film got a lot of attention at the time. Uh, like you said, it won an honorary Academy Award for foreign language film. Um, uh, Pierre Fresnay won a, a best actor at the Venice Film Festival. Um, I believe it's won other awards. The fact that the uh, the Vatican did include it in its 1995 film list got it a little extra attention. But I agree with you that this is a film that is underseen and underappreciated. Uh, it's not just a, a film that is commended by its pious message of interest only to pious people. And I think it really is a loss for yeah. the um, um, for for. Uh, Many people who would find the film moving and interesting, you know, many of the same people who appreciate a movie like Calvary um, Mm -hmm. or, you know, even a film like Of Gods and Men. Um, Mm. These are these these were films that that really crossed lines in terms of of the breadth of their appeal. And and for me as a Catholic film critic, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity for me to have discussions with my mainstream peers and, you know, talk about these films and and about the religious themes in them. And and I I, I agree. I, I think it's it's a shame and a tragedy that Monsieur Vincent is not part of uh, a better known it's not it doesn't have a place in the canon of cinema even among cinephiles it, it is it mm-hmm. is unfortunate yeah do you guys think that the uh that uh pierre fresnay kind of or or that the character of vincent kind of overshadows most of the other characters like i, I don't find a lot of the other characters super memorable i mean they all do fine work you know they serve their purpose but uh none of the others uh really kind of like stand out to me except as kind of part of the story i guess um i think my other favorite is that young man who who kind of leads him through the life of the poor uh, that's probably the most memorable other character to me do do you feel like the 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 rest of the cast is less is more nondescript 
That's an interesting critique, and it's one that I have raised regarding the Romero movie that I mentioned before, uh, the the Raul Julia movie. Um, the, the the weakness that I felt in that film is that uh, Romero as a character just towers over everyone else, and even though his own personal journey is very compelling, uh, there's not really a compelling antagonist for him. For some reason, I don't feel that as an objection to this film, although I will say that there is one character that I think the movie does not give her due, and that is um, Luis de Marillac, uh, who was the co-founder of the Daughters of Charity, and really the the mission partner of um, St. Vincent's life. And she is, she's a saint in the Catholic Church mm. as well. Oh. And uh, the, she is really very much overshadowed in the film. And um, my daughter, Sarah, who knows much more about saints than I do um, and and who is very attentive to these things, pointed out that she felt that um, St. Louis is too much um, lumped with the other wealthy women that Vincent mm -hmm. works with. And, and that her sanctity and her true dedication doesn't come across in the film in the way that it should. So that is hmm. one one criticism, at least from a historical perspective. Now, how much of a how much of a dramatic flaw it is, I, I'd have to think about that some more. Yeah, I don't know that I was. I don't know that I would say it's a flaw, but it, I I was just kind of raising it as a fe a feature of the film. I mean, it it makes sense. I mean, a saint is a more alive person, right, than than the others around him. So uh, it makes sense that he'd be more compelling, more interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, you mentioned founding the charity. We haven't really said much about kind of the big picture why St. Vincent de Paul is, is famous, uh, why he's historically significant. My understanding is that he's essentially the founder of organized charity as such, there's kind of a, like on a mass scale. There's a really wonderful line in the film where Vincent is talking to, uh, I, I guess it's a minister in the tax office or something. And um, when he mentions charity, the man turns to him irritably and says, "You invented charity. It, it used to be some. It was. It used to be a, a fine. Uh, like, oh, I forget the exact wording, but it's like a fine sentiment. It was something for old church ladies to talk about, and we would all wipe a tear and give a coin, you know. But you've you've taken it so far, and and then later in the film, though." Um, as the movie moves very quickly through um, 1645 and 1650 and 1655, we get to a point where people are kind of looking back on Vincent's life and saying, isn't it astonishing that the things that you did, that, that really you brought about, we now consider so normal and, mm. and, um, and so just? And it, it, it really does it is it's my understanding as well that that prior to Vincent, prior and, and certainly prior to his, the, the age in which he lived, charity was fundamentally an individual thing. People did give to the poor, and some people gave a lot to the poor, but there were no ongoing organiz, organized institutions that were devoted to this kind of work. Um and, and so in a way, um, every homeless shelter and every soup kitchen um, is is the fruit of the work of this man. Yeah, and we we uh, this this raises practical problems in the film that we're still facing today, especially with you know what we would call modern philanthropy or government aid, things like that, which is not just the fact that St. Vincent has to spend all this time with rich people specifically, but also the difference between helping the poor institutionally and help and having a face-to-face -face relationship with them, which is something that he's very uh, conflicted over. There's a scene in the film where he's offered this new position and forced to take it of the chaplain to the galley, the Royal galley, something like that. And, uh, you see him like kind of like this is not the opposite of the direction he wants to go in uh he the he he's already feels he's spending too much time talking to people and convincing people to give and he doesn't hasn't spoken to a poor person he hasn't known their name he hasn't he hasn't had a face to face relationship with them for some time already um so that's sort of part of the practical dilemma as he's founding this new kind of work in the world that uh 
he needs to keep his uh, the smell of the sheep, as Pope Francis puts it, um, in addition to kind of serving the maximum number of people. We see his ambition very early on, um, and it's not wrong, but it, it causes problems for uh, where his heart really dwells. Vincent's ministry as as chaplain of the galleys is one of the things that really gets short shrift in the film. Um, Madame de Gandhi, who uh, is the, the the woman that he was the uh, the chaplain for her family, and and he leaves in order to become the pastor of uh, Châtillon, um, and and she later comes and finds him and brings him back. Her husband. Uh, is the general of the galleys, and he's the one who puts the word in the king's ear to have Vincent appointed as the the chaplain of the galleys. And this is really dealt with in just one scene. We see Vincent on a ship that's being rowed by galley slaves, and these are uh, men who have been sentenced to galley labor as a result of crime. So it's a it's it's penal slavery. It's not the kind of of um, of racialized hereditary chattel slavery um, that uh, arises in conjunction or in connection with the, the transatlantic slave trade, uh, but it's still brutal and horrible. And and uh, he was yeah. he was very much against it. And we see him becoming increasingly uncomfortable as, as the slaves are being whipped in order to get a little extra speed as part of a, a kind of a, almost a race between two galleys. And someone says to Vince, and he's they're very cavalier about it, he, they say, oh, the, they, the slaves even, they ask for the whip to help them get that last little bit of strength. And it, when he can't stand it anymore, he gets up and he runs down the deck and he finds the slave that he, he feels is at the utmost ends of his strength, pushes him aside and takes his place. And um, the next scene we see Vincent, uh, he's, he's in bed and he's dictating his will. So um, <laughs> we're, we're meant to assume that this, that this was really, it was a really um, uh, strenuous moment in his life. But Vincent became uh, a the, the chaplain to the galley slaves themselves, and he he ministered to the slaves, and this was a significant part of his work to yeah. the poorest and the most needy. Um, and then we don't, unfortunately, that's that you know, there's just he had such a rich life, and there was no way for the film to include all of it, and so so many things are just kind of alluded to in that mm. way. Do you think that this scene is a good scene to be included in the film? I mean, it it does feel a little bit like kind of out of place in the rest of the film. I mean, thematically it's, it's, it's in place, but it's just this one galley scene. Uh, I don't know. It seems kind of like this strange, strange inclusion. Do you, do you think that it, it's kind of too little to even include at all to like, just to like gesture to that part of his life? It's an interesting question. Um, I, I'm not sure that it, it contributes to the, um, the the thematic cohesion of the film, um, as as well as a lot of the other scenes, and and yet, um, I'm, I, I I have a weakness for a certain um, style in movies that I sometimes call uh, encyclopedic. Um, I, I like movies that just make a make a heap of things and. Uh, even even if they're they don't necessarily even if everything doesn't necessarily fit, um, I I just I tend to like more rather than less. And and I know that sometimes I I know that the essence of of art is often withholding, and that's part of the power of this film is is all the things that it does withhold. You couldn't make this film in color and have it be the same film. The fact that it's black and white, the fact that color is withheld, is part of what gives it its power. Um, the fact that context is withheld from that opening scene in um, Châtillon um, is part of the power of that scene. It's part of what draws us in. Um, so I can understand the argument that the scene in the galleys might have been better left out. Um, but but for me, one of the ways that this movie functions, and one of the ways that I felt certainly after watching it for the first time, and I think I've heard indications in this in this discussion that I'm not alone in this, I got to the end of this movie and said, you know, I don't know more about this guy. And then mm -hmm. I went, I looked him up on Catholic Encyclopedia, and I looked him up on Wikipedia, and I did a little, you know, a little further reading. And, and I think that that's a valid way for a movie to function as well. Well, we're on the topic of possible flaws. There's one scene where 
there's like the only voiceover in the film where he's now narrating the development of the daughters of charity. Uh, that seems like a flaw to me. I, you're, you're an experienced film critic, Steven. Do you think that having just one voiceover for practical purposes in a movie that has no voiceover is, do you think that's a, a no, no? I, I think that the movie gets a little shaggier as it goes on. Um, I think that it's most cohesive and and strongest in narrative tone in the in the first act compared to the other two acts and in the first half compared to the second half and that voiceover and and the rush through the decades uh toward the end is is part of that shagginess i think the best movies about famous people often focus on one particular chapter in their life and I right. think that we see here an example of how the movie starts off in a, in a very strong way because it is doing that. Um, yeah. They they really they take us through to the end of his life. Um, does it diffuse the movie's artistic power? I think that's fair. That's something that James and I have talked about a couple of times when we've discussed biopics. We did recently did the uh, Carrie Elwes, uh, John Voight, John, uh, John Paul II film and uh, biopics tend to want to put everything in there and then it gets more and more like just snippets but <laughs> we, we also laugh about the fact that they always have to show you the very moment that this iconic photograph of the person was taken <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um james is there is there anything else that you'd like to discuss about this film i want to give you a chance to Thanks. No, you know, I, I think that the the biggest takeaway for me uh, watching this film is the confirmation that that uh, that holiness is is exciting and high stakes and uh, and an adventure. Right. I think yeah. that if this film were made today, we would we would we would end where this film begins. Basically, it would be a film about uh, this uh, mediocre priest you know, seeking after uh, uh, a comfortable life and then experiencing a conversion and dedicating himself to the poor. The fact that this film starts there and then takes us through the the, the higher echelons of, of spiritual struggle uh, is a really, really remarkable thing and something that I wish we saw a lot more of today. It's so interesting the way that this film develops his character because he starts the film as a man who has a lot of experience of life and of human beings. And it doesn't seem like he's really surprised by much of anything. I mean, uh, for example, an inexperienced priest, an inexperienced, sincere Catholic might walk into that room of rich people who have sealed a, a woman they think has the plague up in her house, leaving her to die and then plan to burn it after she's died uh, along with her daughter. Um, they might freak out and yell at the people. He doesn't waste time. He like takes in the information, doesn't even bother reproaching them essentially, and just leaves. He's like, I'm not going to waste my time here. Um, as the film goes on, interestingly, you, you see him shocked by more things, starting with that scene where he's staying in the poor tenements. But I wanted to bring up the most wrenching scene, which is the debate over what to do with foundlings. So he's he sees this this woman trying to leave her infant in front of a church, this single mother. She there's already a dead baby on the steps of the church, by the way. So it's clear what's gonna happen. Nobody's gonna take this baby. Uh we have a a, a homeless man with no legs right next to it who explains the whole situation to him. And he goes to his women, uh his ladies council who are already kind of rebelling over all the things they've been asked to do. And he brings them this baby and it's profoundly shocking to our sensibilities today. Uh, we've gone almost in the, the complete opposite direction that these women are convinced this baby is a product of sin and, and maybe God doesn't want it to live. And uh, it's profoundly shocking to hear them say that. And Vincent is profoundly disturbed to hear yeah. them say it. And we get the mo the highest intensity from him in the entire film of of outrage. 
And he, uh, if, if anybody listening has ever been sharply rebuked by a holy person, they know that this is like, this is actually what it's like. The film does, a, it's very real, the way that he responds. And she, this one woman says, um, you know, is it, is it, uh, the Countess, uh, Duchess of Gandhi or no, no. Uh, anyway, um, uh, she says, maybe God wants, wants him to die. And he and he yells when God wants someone to die, to pay for sin. And then he gets quiet and he says, he sends his son. Um, and then there's this whole, whole debate in the room. Uh, and we see him becoming increasingly like giving up hope in, in these, in these people in, in, in that moment, all the trust he's put in them. It's such an interesting going from the initial meeting of these women where you see them being frivolous. But if you're looking, watching the film from a Catholic perspective, you're, you're kind of like seeing, okay, like trouble is coming with these women. If the, if they, what seems funny at the, at, in this moment is going to lead to bigger problems down the road. And it, and it is really more shocking than you would have imagined uh, that that would have been an attitude in Catholic France. And, and I think that, there may well be um, there may well be historical truths to that moment, and certainly it speaks to things that are true in human nature. I think this is one of the one of the scenes in which um, Saint Louis de Mauriac, uh was was ill served because the ministry uh, that w- that Vincent founded um, with her to t- undertake the work of, of saving infants who were abandoned in the streets. It was really like the Daughters of Charity. It was a joint project of the two of them. Uh, I'm not aware of any information that he had to persuade her as, as opposed to many of the other women who he may well have had to persuade. Um, the, the word that you quoted from my review early on, the, the idea of single-mindedness, um, uh, connects with me to an idea that I just find running all through the film and which is something that I think about and I struggle with all the time. Um, because ultimately, sanctity is not a matter of saying the right things or thinking the right things or caring about the right things. It's a matter of doing the right things. Um, um, a, the, a Brazilian uh, nun and um, uh, founder of uh, a charitable organization, um, uh, I'm not sure how her name is pronounced um, in Portuguese, but in English it looks like uh, Irma Dulce, um, she she has a famous quote that um, uh, the important thing about charity is not to talk about it, but to do it. And that is Vincent's constant focus. Um, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? How can I help? How can I make the world a better place? How Who is the person who demands my time and attention and my help in this moment? Um, and, and that drives him in the interpretation of this film to, to his last days to the point where he really is no longer has the physical strength to do the things that he wants to do, but he just, he keeps, he keeps pushing his body. And, um, you know, I think about our, our Lord's, uh, words in the parable of the sheep and the goats and, uh, the judgment that awaits all of us based on what we do or don't do for the least of these and um and i know that (laughs) it's it's not enough just to think about it yeah yeah well that's certainly um something worth worth hearing when you're (laughs) engaged in the very act of uh talking about a film like this for an hour you know um i I feel like now thomas and i have special responsibility (laughs) to do something yeah, and there's that. Yeah, it's not just the the doing of it, but the spirit in which of it's which it's done. That's beautiful final line that he speaks in the film. Like, only by your love will the poor forgive you for the bread that you're giving them. Mm. Um, Stephen, I wanted to. We're gonna wrap up here, but I wanted to, if 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 you would like, give you a chance uh, to take a moment to say something uh, about this film in the context of the Vatican film list. You're Perhaps the only person, there might be one other person we've had on who has seen the entire list. Um, we certainly haven't. So I wanted to give you a chance to just touch on that real quick. Well, I think that um, it's an interesting example of the overlap among the categories of the Vatican film list. I mean, 
there are 15 films in each of these three categories of of religion, um, values, and art. And um, you look sometimes at some of the films and you wonder why this category rather than another. But I'm not sure that any film really belongs so fully to all three categories as, mm. as Monsieur Vincent. And that really is, is the secret of its power. Um, um, Pope Pius XII in his addresses on the ideal film in 1955 to representatives of the Italian film industry um, talks about um, the, the power of cinema to offer rays of truth, goodness, and beauty, which in the tradition of uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, he expounds upon as um, um, manifestations uh, for in, in the great continuity of being um, running all the way up essentially to, to God himself, but broken down in the prism of consciousness to enable us to perceive these different aspects of God um, in, these, in these three different qualities. But I think as we go up the chain of being, we discover more and more the identity of truth, goodness, and beauty. And of all the films in the Vatican film list, Monsieur Vincent might realize that identity of truth, perhaps corresponding to the category of religion, uh, goodness corresponding to the category of values, and beauty corresponding to the category of art. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we have, uh, I think we have 22 films left on the list, something like that. Uh, so eventually we will get to the top of the mountain and be able to, you know, look at uh, the domain we've conquered and kind of get a sense of the whole. Uh, but Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Your insights were very appreciated.